Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration with the New Art School and Design the Dutch podcast. Our guest today is Jan Eckert. Welcome, Jan. Welcome. Good morning. Fantastic to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Lefteris. So tell us about you and your work. Well, uh, I'm a design educator based in Switzerland um, and originally I'm trained as an interior architect and then step by step I transitioned uh, into the acad academic world and started uh, as an assistant teacher, researcher, uh, PhD candidate and now I'm currently working as head of three MA programs at the local university here in Lucerne, MA in design, MA in service design and MA in digital ideation. The latter being a collaboration between our computer sciences department and the design department. So that's quite a new program, quite interesting as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. So what, what is your project you're working on now? I think the main project in the past, let's say, four years was really rethinking the MA curriculum in design. Um, when I started um, uh, my current position as head of the MA program, uh, we had this kind of very generic program that used to be split up in so-called specializations. So um, our university tried to kind of, um, let's say, um, provide a specialization for any BA program they had while packing them all into one MA program. And as you might imagine, that comes with advantages, but also with some challenges, having people from very you know, different backgrounds studying the same curriculum. So I spent, together with my team, we spent around two years of redeveloping that uh, curriculum. Um, and we did so by um, really studying the local design context, um, especially when it comes to the, uh, the what, what is called the creative uh, economies. And at the, da at the time, the latest, um, or now there's, there's been another one, but at the time, um, the Swiss uh, Creative Economy Report was being published by Simon um, Meckler, uh, Simon Grant and Christoph Weckler in uh, Zurich. And that helped us a lot because they really mapped out what is happening um, in the job world. And one of the main findings was uh, more and more designers um, don't stay in what they call the creative core. So let's say a graphic designer um, working in a graphic design studio, but they kind of slowly transition into other sectors, telecommunication, um, uh, mobility, um, traveling, tourism, and so on. And we thought, uh, well, that's quite an interesting fact because um, it might be useful preparing our, our future students for this sort of transition. And so our main curriculum really started being much more about collaboration with other disciplines than design. And I'd say that uh, that is my main project that I'm kind of still working on and that I've been working on for the past three years. Fantastic, that, that sounds very interesting. I mean, uh, I, I saw your work on your uh, distance education. Oh yeah, great, yeah. And that was very interesting. Could you tell us something some, some about Sure. Uh, well, we, we're still um, in a remote situation here uh, in Switzerland since uh, we had kind of an intense phase of the pandemic that we went through or still going through um, uh, from September on. But back in March, when the first uh, severe wave hit Europe and uh, most of the universities had to shut down, uh, our university here in, uh, in Lucerne decided to shut down any kind of activity for seven days. So they said um, no one really uh, is, is uh, giving or taking lessons or courses. We take seven days to kind of rethink how to transition to remote uh, teaching, which at the time was something that was rarely used. I mean, there've been, I know some of my colleagues might, you know, uh, record a screencast, having maybe an online session whenever they weren't on our campus, but we did not have any remote courses set up. So what I did, um, uh, since it was pretty clear that this was about to come, I started developing uh, what is called the distance learning blueprint. Um, and basically, those who are familiar with service design blueprints know that it's more or less like a customer journey or the, there's a timeline, let's say, of a process and you have different channels of communication, let's say, or where you create touch points. And one of the major problems that we were going to face uh, was that at the time, everyone was going online, right? Every single university, all the companies. So bandwidth uh, during daytime 
could become a critical resource, right? And another thing that we realized is uh, people are not used to staying online all day, right? So having, let's say, uh, most of our courses are one day or two day courses. So staying online for eight hours and having a course, that was something impossible. So, so uh, uh, we imagined uh, neither, you know, Uh, faculty members nor the students would would be able to keep concentration and engagement up all that time. So what we did, we really tried to keep the lifetime, so also the time that requires high bandwidth, when large amount of learners connect life with uh, a course leader, let's say, we try to keep that time as, as small as possible or as short as possible. So um, the blueprint really for these Uh, most of the activity going on in an asynchronous way. So where people, let's say, watch a screencast, write a little report, and maybe use those um, digital whiteboards that became very popular in the past few months and work together. So the key word here is really peer learning, learning, right? So students teaching students or uh, learning from each other. And that turned out uh, as a very good experience because one thing is we rarely had to struggle with technical issues. So we didn't need that high bandwidth uh, with let's say a huge group of learners being connected. And the second thing is we really had very short, maximum 40 minutes um, live sessions and then a lot of peer exercises. And that was a great success. And uh, we restarted doing that in uh, the end of September, beginning of October again. Yeah. And those who are interested, it's, it's an open resource. You can go to my website, janekert.ch, and, and there's a section called Learn Online. You can download the, uh, the blueprint. I also developed um, an Excel tool that is meant for the course leaders to rearrange the courses. So you can find everything there. That's, it's a really it's a really good work. So that that is that is applied to service design courses, or is it to, to courses to art and design courses in general? It's um, let's say it's it's used all across our MA programs in design, service design, and digital ideation, but mostly for courses that um, don't deal, let's say, with physical matter, because uh, we all know th this is something hard to replace. So uh, whenever, um, that's also one reason why currently our students have an exceptional uh, access to the wood labs or workshops, let's say. So anything that doesn't deal with uh, physical matter um, was replaced with that blueprint. So, so right. let's say, um, a course in design and ethics, for instance, yes. right? That, that works pretty well uh, based upon that scheme. So that, that was more for the theory for the theory courses rather than the practice courses. Well, you just mentioned a term I don't like very much, <laughs> theory. And um, well, not that I'm saying just, I, I'm I, just to create a schematic. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and not to uh, you know. Um, I'm totally aware of the design theory and history, but something we try to. Um, Uh, um, well established uh, at our MA programs is a certain attitude uh, towards theory. Um, and let me explain just a, a, a few seconds because it's really part of, the, of, of my um, um, pedagogical um, uh, concept also that I try to convey to both our faculty members and students. Many students um, in our MA programs, they join us from BA programs, from very traditional BA programs. So a lot of studio work, right? Most is Uh, practice-based, which isn't a bad thing at all, right? Um, but on the other hand, some of them, they come with the idea that uh, theory, ah, that's the boring part of my BA studies, right? Oh, those were the lessons I had to sit somewhere and listen to someone. And uh, one thing we never, we rarely teach in a setting here uh, in my MA programs where someone is talking and uh, 30 people are listening. So most of it is based upon workshops, even if we are at the campus and peer learning. And second thing, uh, something that we try to tell our students, look, sure, there is theories, there is models, there is research approaches, there is a lot about design history, but don't split your head into design theory and design practice, because at the end, everything should come together in your MA project. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to give you a little uh, note on that as well. Absolutely, but it's, it's such a huge discussion right now about uh, design education and uh, you know, uh, some universities are doing physical, you know, uh, learning, some are doing blended, some are doing 100%, you know, so it's all that discussion that we're all in right now, and it's very interesting Definitely. Uh, about how we will forge the future of design education. Oh, yes, well. Uh, just named another interesting topic, <laughs> future of design education or future of education as a whole, I think. 
um, yeah, if you want, I can uh, share some thoughts on that because it was really part of the curriculum development um, uh, to understand uh, where is higher education um, heading as a whole, right? Um, and I think um, at the moment we're still in a quite comfortable situation, even if we had this entire trouble with the pandemic. Uh, but higher education institutions, institutions are quite well established. Even younger disciplines such as design um, are established now uh, in most of the places. Uh, but if we think ahead, like, and I, I'd say about 50 to 80 years ahead, um, uh, something started um, uh, that has been already kind of anticipated, I would say, by people like, well, of course, by people um, working in computer sciences, but also of great thing by great thinkers such as Tomas Maldonado, the um, last uh, rector of the Ulm School of Design, who started already in the 90s, reflecting a lot about digital technologies, you know, the entire, um, uh, uh, let's say, digital shift, digital transformation, as it is called now. And um, a lot of the job future, of course, is related to that, uh, to that great shift there. And if you take a look at some of the reports, for instance, published by the World Economic Forum, it's called Job of the Future, um, a report that is, I think, um, um, published biannually, uh, it becomes more and more clear that many of the jobs or activities that are part of our jobs uh, might get replaced, right, by, let's say, let's call them intelligent systems, if even if, if we know they're not really intelligent, but behind there is what we call intellig um, artificial, artificial intelligence and so on. Um, and this is, of course, you know, this process is getting faster and faster. Um, and um, uh, the more we develop in that, um, uh, in that field, the more we get aware that the less we know about our future when it comes to what is really work, right? So if we take a very... Um, extreme hypothesis here. Let's say in 80 um, years, which is still far away, but you know, close enough, um, work as we know it today um, won't have it, uh, the same meaning to society. So today, of course, we need to work for both sense-making, uh, but also for existential uh, reasons, right? Uh, everyone needs to pay his or her bills. Um, and I think that might change, or it, it needs to change. I mean, some of the countries, Switzerland included, were voting for or against a basic income, for instance. And uh, that makes clear that uh, this entire thing called work um, will change. Uh, now, if you take a look at education, most of education uh, is really aiming at a career in the, in the job market or in order to transition into the job or work world, right? So if we take that meaning of work away, uh, what happens to education then? And I think that's quite an interesting question because um, most of the students, they are willing to invest time, resources, and even money um, by acquiring, let's say, um, not the security, but but by having this feeling, okay, and, and after that, I'm ready to transition into the work world, right? But what if this is a way? What if this work world does not exist anymore? So I think higher education as a whole is facing quite an interesting future here. Um, personally, I think it will be much more about sense-making and purpose than about employability, for instance. Uh, and now the question is, how do we kind of integrate that a big thought into our next curricula, which can start having some of these elements. And in design education, I think one, or there is, let's say, um, two core elements that, that um, uh, became important um, for me as a design educator that, that, that I think can take us with baby steps towards this kind of uncertain future. Um, now, one element is stewardship. Um, if you uh, take a look at that term in, in the dictionary, there's a fantastic um, example of uh, farmers pride themselves of being stewards uh, of the countryside, right? So they're not the people selling you potatoes at the market. No, it's much more. They are responsible. They take responsibility for a certain context that they work in. And I think that's a wonderful concept. And stewardship in design would mean oh, we're not the ones selling fancy stuff or designing fancy stuff. We're the ones taking responsibility for a whole ecosystem of 
services, products, and so on. And, and more, moreover, we also take responsibility for the people um, and uh, that we design for, right? So one, uh, one thing is stewardship. And the second uh, um, uh, element that I think we need to incorporate into design education is leadership and the readiness to collaborate with other disciplines than design. Because um, when I think back of, of, of my own studies, most of the project where, um, oh, I do something with my fellow interior architecture student, or I do something with someone from graphic design, but it all stays in the same bubble. I rarely you know, had to face, let's say, a computer scientist, uh, someone working in, um, in molecular biology or something. But these collaborations are becoming more and more important, especially if we take a look at the complexity of problems that we are facing as society and humanity. So I think both stewardship, like this attitude of taking, of being responsible for something and leadership and collaboration, I think those are the, uh, the core elements that um, um, at least for me as a design educator became very important when teaching at any level. No, oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. What are the challenges that uh, you are facing right now in this current, in, this, in the current paradigm? Um, I think it's very um, similar to many other places. Um, higher education uh, institutions um, are used to be split up into silos. Like you have a department of this, a department of that, a faculty of this, a faculty of that. <clears throat> so per se, it's already um, uh, kind of hard to break up those silos, especially if each and everyone is running his or her own curriculum, um, needs to get his or her own funding and so on. So from a structural point of view, many of the higher educations aren't really well prepared to face those more kind of, you know, um, uh, those concepts such as um, issue-based learning, theme-based learning, and so on. Or in general, a post-disciplinary approach is not very supported by many of the structures that we face in higher education. So I think... Um, that will be one of the main challenges in the next uh, decade to rethink those structures or finding ways around as it already happens in many places. That's, that's the next question about you know, if you had a magic wand, if you, if you could, if you could uh, correct something right now, like to go, <laughs> what, what, would we, what, what would you do? Ooh, yeah, it's the magic wand here, yeah, right? <clears throat> um, I, when I think of the situation that I'm facing here in, uh, in uh, Swiss territory, um, it's really those silos. So you have universities, you have universities of applied sciences and arts, uh, you have some even some private institutions that are being part of the higher education landscape, you have more and more players coming up, um, for instance, offering uh, programs online. Um, so this even breaks it up into many more things. So um, if we would think um, of higher education as a real public good, right? So uh, I'm a citizen, uh, I'm a European citizen or Swiss citizens here, and um, I have the right to access these things. And they're really uh, somehow, let's say, they are provided without this entire queue of um, uh, administrative and also economic factors that are bound to those silos. So um, let me explain maybe a little bit uh, further. Uh, for instance, if I take a look at the local situation here, even each of our departments um, is based upon different economical uh, logics. So salaries are different, um, at the amounts of hours that can be spent for teaching are different. And uh, those things become quite a hurdle when it comes to collaboration, right? And if that was kind of blended away by saying, look, uh, we need to face this together and we find a way to finance it, because yeah. most of the time it really comes down to money and resources, then I think many of the you know, daily problems wouldn't be there. But it's a hard one. It's a very complicated one. You're referring one. To, a, to a greater independence of the schools, which is, which is, which is a, a problem worldwide, is that uh, the schools are not independent enough and they don't have the flavor. And if they were independent, then they would collaborate better. Yeah. It really depends what independ uh, independence means. Hmm. I think some people um, perceive that the post Bolognese uh, model really helped them to become more independent. And I think in some way that might be even true because 
I remember back at the time when I still studied before uh, BA and MA were introduced in, in Germany, I was born and raised there. Um, most of the schools had more the same, more or less the same profile. So the Bolognese system really helped them to create profiles, right? So I think from that point of view, they became a little bit more independent, right? What creates a little, uh, or not a, uh, a little confusion, what, what creates uh, a big confusion is the attempt to quantify what we call learning. Yeah. Uh, by assigning credit points to this, Perfect. credit points to that. And I think that is something that no one really had thought through. Um, uh, and from that point, it's true. Uh, sometimes this becomes, this this kind of lowers the, the independence because uh, to be very honest, as, as the head of three MA programs, uh, most of the emails I receive from students are about credit points. And that's quite sad because I think, well, instead of, of discussing this stuff, we could have a great, you know, discussion on, on real content there. Having, yes, we're having, this is a greater discussion about great addiction that starts from early years. And of course, you know, there's a, there's a huge, uh, there's a huge area there. Fantastic. So how can our viewers and listeners find you? Well, they can find me on some of the social channels. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm also on ResearchGate somewhere, but uh, to be very honest, I, I'm not uh, taking care too much about, uh, about that one. But I have a website, it's called uh, janeckert.ch, and um, I, it's rather blocked than a website. I sometimes, from now and then, I publish some things about conferences. Uh, I'm sure this, uh, this fantastic podcast will end up there as well. And so I share some of my resources that I develop as a design educator as well. Great, great. What advice would you like to leave us with? Well, <laughs> if I speak to, let's say, the community of design educators out there, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think what's, uh, what some of our students are going through can be described as the process of unlearning, right? And, and which does not mean you have to um, forget about everything you've learned. It, it really means replacing rather the mental model that uh, kind of, you know, that makes you approach things. And I think, and I wish as design educators, we should be also ready to unlearn some of the things that we might be stuck with as both from an institutional point of view or from, um, you know, a pedagogical point of view and be ready to unlearn of that, some of that stuff and change the mental model of um, design education in higher education. And if, if we are able to face that, uh, I think then, then really we don't need that magic wand anymore. Then magic will happen anyway. <laughs> because it, it, there's a lot of magic people out there. Thank you so much for your time. And looking forward to future collaboration. Thank you, Lefteri. Thank you for having me.